Robin began uh, his working on parasites. Uh, I'm sorry. Robin began working on parasites responsible for uh, causing sumo in 1977. 1977. Ten years old. It's amazing. <laughs> Under the mentorship of Dr. Harvey, Harvey Boynton at Hope College, and Harvey is uh, kind of the godfather of all of this work. Um, in 1983, he and Harvey began 25 years, 25 years of summer field work, a partnership focused on education research and control of summer's itch on lakes in Wisconsin, Maine, and Michigan. And as, a, as an aside, he currently volunteers at Hope College campus ministries during the academic year while focusing his, focusing his attention on freshwater solutions, the name of his company that I mentioned earlier, and the work on innovative summer resist strategies for lakes in Michigan during the spring and summer months. Uh, I just want to say that my experience in working with Ron is he's one of the most dedicated guys I've ever seen and uh, he brings a huge passion to his work and Ron says it's going to happen, so it happens. Thank you, Ted. I want to play off what Ted just said. Um, we have a lot of people to thank. For me being here today, uh, so many people to thank. In 1977, uh, as, as Ted said, Harvey Blankensport, Dr. Blankensport was the father of uh, Stormer's Itch Research in Michigan. And he took a chance on an 18-year-old. Uh, I was a freshman uh, January. I was majoring in basketball and girls, and I had never taken a biology class, and I took his class. He invited me to work in his lab, and um, we developed a relationship, and I have a lot to give thanks for, for Harvey. Some people don't know all the story, but in 1983, this guy right here, and we've heard his name over and over, but I'm going to say it again. One Lake Association, Rob Carter, was applying lots of copper sulfate to kill snail strike control swimmers not something he's proud of. But he just said there has to be a better way. And he went online and looked to see who's, who knows something about swimmers that kept coming up with Harvey going to school. Called Harvey. Harvey got a hold of me. I graduated a couple years and said, do you want to go to Glen Lake and, and work? And that was in 1983. And, and we wouldn't be here today if those events hadn't happened. And it was uh, Rob's uh, being very instrumental in that happening. And people don't maybe know this part of the story, but then it worked on one light. Uh, some ideas, some research, some discoveries we made. And then uh, Brian and Susan Price with the Lee Long Observatory said, you know, we have to take this uh, wider. We can't just do this on Glen Lake uh, for environmental reasons. We wanted to not do the copper sulfate, and they were instrumental in helping us expand and do other lakes. Uh, and along with, so that's, that's you know, ancient history in a sense, uh, but more recently, why are we back in the game? Why is all of this happening here? Certainly, we mentioned Jim Bondale, uh, Ken Dennings, and me a couple years ago, um, and many volunteers. Uh, I should put in there, um, uh, let's see, well, yeah, I won't. I'll miss some people. So, that's uh, Higgins Lake Swimmers Inch Organization. The, we're here today Jim Bondale, Ted Fisher, Susan Price, many volunteers. Um, tip of the Mint, Gail and Lynn. Glenn Lake, Rob Carn, Bill is here, Whitler, many volunteers. Uh, Lake Lila, Lake Association, Nick Bazanis, Wayne Swallow, Kurt Trump, uh, Lime Lake, Dean Manikas, many others, and Crystal Lake, Ted Fisher, Al Flory, Joel Bazell is here. Um, and so, yeah, and John, you know, we, we've already talked about John, so, and, and I'm sure I miss people, but uh, a lot of people here volunteering so that we could make this happen. I want to talk about the Lilano project. That was what I was involved with this summer. Four, uh, four lakes, really, Glen, North Lake Lilano, South Lake Lilano, and Lime Lake. The crew that I had uh, for the Freshwater Solutions, I'm up in the corner, up in the right there, uh, Kelsey and Chris Freilich. Uh, Kelsey is my daughter, and she grew up uh, on, on a lake every summer. We were on one lake for three summers, uh, South Lake Lilano for three summers. Um, Lime Lake for three summers, Douglas Lake for three summers. So she grew up and she grew into a biologist. Uh, I tried to convince my son, but he went the geology route. But uh, she uh, then has been working with her husband for the last three summers, full time in the summer doing the summer's 
sir. This guy right here, Patrick Hannington, I had the good pleasure of meeting him uh, when I went up to the University of Alberta uh, to visit my son who was getting his PhD there, and Patrick is uh, Canada's Mr. Swimmer's Itch, and he uh, is doing a lot of work with Swimmer's Itch, and I uh, struck up, uh, spent half a day with him, invited him to Michigan, he's been here twice now, uh, and, and is collaborating with everything that I'm doing. I also have a heart for students. We work with students over the years, many, many students. Uh, Randy was one of them that worked with us, with Harvey and I. And uh, just to give opportunity to, to young people, uh, Aaron Van Kemp is a senior at Piedmont College in Georgia. And he is, uh, hopes to get us uh, to go on with an advanced degree in bioinformatics or biostatistics. And then Sydney, I don't want to forget Sydney because she came two years ago, but last this past summer she didn't come, but she is uh, working on her PhD under Patrick, and she's doing a lot of the lab work at the University uh, of Alberta for us. And so that was our team for this summer. I, many of you are educated, um, but I want to give a quick biology refresher because of the things I want to talk about for you to understand the basic life cycle. This is uh, uh, the irony here, maybe you can't see it with the lighting, but this little girl with pink shoes uh, has got some pretty bad swimmer's itch. I took that picture. She was actually the daughter of a um, uh, limnology professor. I was working on my, my master's degree at the University of Michigan Biological Station at the very place where they discovered, court in 1928, discovered the life cycle. And here's this little girl right on the shore, and uh, she had bad swimmer's itch and took that picture. So let's take a look at the general life cycle uh, above water. Top there, the adult worms, or the male and female worms. And those worms, the females lay eggs. The eggs go in the water, go down, you know, gravity down to the bottom. The, the eggs are fully embryonated, they hatch out into the, what are called myricidium. This myricidium turns into a sporocyst, which is like a larvae factory. And these guys right here produce a whole bunch of cercari. Those are the things then that turn into the adult worms. So here's the basic life cycle. Now, what you're more familiar with, the common scenario that we're dealing with here in northern Michigan, at least on these five lakes that we've been working with, the adult worms live in, in merganser, common merganser, male and female. The female produces eggs that get deposited with the feces in the water. They hatch, this mirror city lives for a day, searches out one species of snail, snag nickel snail. About 30 days later, that sporocyst that was in there, this thing here, starts kicking out hundreds or even thousands of these cercari every day, every morning. These things, it's important to know, these things here actually go to the top. They swim up to the top. And they're looking for merganser when swimmers get in the way that we become the accidental host. So what you have to remember is what causes swimmers itch. We like to blame the snails. We like to blame the organsers. It's the, the worms. Parasites cause swimmers itch. And that coming out of the snail. So there's a basic life cycle. What does that give you? This was day I took this of a friend who was visiting when we were living on Lime Lake. And uh, nasty. And that's that same girl on Douglas Lake now. So let's talk about control, what we did uh, on these lakes with the Lilano project. Uh, before I do that, this Rob forwarded this to me this summer. I don't have the name attached to it. But here's why we're doing what we do. He wrote, this is unbearable. My seven-year-old and six-year-old daughters are wailing nonstop with extreme and uncontrollable itching. Vacation is not fun like this. It's terrible. I've been coming up here every, every, every summer since I was in the womb. This is the worst I've ever seen it. Please do something. There has to be something that can be done to control. There's urgency there, right? That was one like this summer. So let's talk about control. Historically, copper sulfate killed all the snails. We know only two or three percent are infected of one species. Environmentally, there's some questions about you know, whether that's a smart thing to do. In 1983, the first year, uh, Harvey and I were on uh, Glen Lake, we discovered that mergansers are a big carrier of one species that seems to be uh, causing a lot, of, a lot of the itch on Glen Lake. 
that led to trapping and relocating protocols. Um, I learned a lot. I should mention another person's name. He has passed. But Joe Johnson right here from Michigan State University taught me uh, volumes about how to handle birds, how to trap birds. Uh, and then fellow in the middle is uh, actually a guy from the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from Traverse City. And then that was in 1985, and then uh, this summer again, still trapping her hand. Mentioned before, Ted mentioned this, but just to show you snail infection rate, 1985 on Glen Lake, 2%. Just just trapping and relocating her hand way down, 0.3%. On Higgins Lake, 30 years later, we repeated that, 2015, 3%, 2016, uh, down to less than 0.3%, so 90% reduction. So we know that that uh, protocol works to reduce uh, swimmers. Age. So our numbers, Glen Lake, uh, nine broods. We removed 99 birds. I put an asterisk there to remind me to talk about, one of those was a crash. In other words, uh, two broods come together, hens with their chicks come together, and then uh, they do something, and then one leaves with all. That's called a crash. Uh, so there were really, uh, there were eight, nine broods represented, there were, uh, we trapped eight broods. We found it really difficult, much more difficult, to trap the birds on one lake because of the great job they did with harassing the birds for several years. <laughs> they were much more difficult to trap on one lake. It made their job a lot more difficult. On Lime Lake, we had three broods, 27 birds, and there was one crash. I had the opportunity to watch that happen. And this is really kind of weird, but I have a place on Lime Lake, and on a Sunday morning, I'm at about 7.30, I look out, and I knew there were two broods on the lake that we were gonna trap. One brood had a, a she had a, a 12 young, and the other one had seven. And I look out, and there's a brood of 12, and there's a brood of seven, and with the hens, and they came together. And I thought this would be interesting, so I took out my field uh, journal, and I'm just taking time down and journaling this, and I watched for almost two hours. I watched, and they didn't move, they stayed in front of my place, which was really weird. What happened, they came together, all the chicks went together to form a 19, there were 19 of them, and the two hens duped it out, and then they came back, and one hen took 10, and the other hen took 10. And then they came back, <laughs> this is crazy, they came back, and they duped it out, and one just said, I'm out of here, left. And then the other one said, I'm out of here too, and left the other way, and all the chicks were there by themselves. <laughs> And then I watched, and I'm recording all this, and they came back, and, and one took some of them, and, and they went this way, and, and some went on their own without a mom, went this way, and they weren't even numbers. It wasn't the 12 and 7. Long story short, at the end of the day, one female had all 19. That's a crash. What I didn't know was who wins. Is it the dominant female or the, is it like the other one? You take them, I give them some wrong. Fortunately, two summers ago we started trapping on Lion Lake. There were two broods, trapped them both, banded them both. Last year there were two broods, trapped them both, banded them both. So I have two. I knew there were two birds that were banded. Well, this year there were three broods on line. The other two birds, we well when, when I went out when we went out and trapped as 19, the, the crash, it was the banded female, and then there was another group with a band, so that female was the new one. So we, I think we're pretty certain that it's the dominant female gets gets the chance. So pretty interesting. North Lake Lil, four broods. I put an asterisk there because we had a brood come out of a tree. Hatch, August 7th. Doesn't mean anything to you. Been doing this for a lot of years. The latest we ever saw a group come out of a tree was last year on Higgins Lake, July 15. And we we were going to write a book on it. July 15. That's incredible because by July 4, everything's done. They're they're done. They don't renest. I got a call from Wayne, an email from Wayne, said, "Yeah, there's a report of a new group. This is August 7th. I'm like, yeah, right." Okay, I 
called the person and they said, well, one of the chicks didn't stay with it and my neighbor picked it up, put it in a box. I said, do they still have it? Yeah, they still have it. I'm going over there. It's a merganza, a one day old merganza. So the next day we went and trapped the you know, one day old, two day old merganza off there August 8th. Unbelievable, I've never seen that before. There's some theories, I, I won't get into that. I'm gonna run out of time, I can tell already. Uh, 174 total mergansers trapped and relocated, 100% success on the ducklings, we got them all. We missed a couple of the uh, uh, hens early going, first couple days. Um, the asterisk is because one of the hens that we missed was being actively shot at by a rifle on North Lake Leona while we were trapped. <coughs> And so that's kind of scary, um, and we didn't get her. <laughs> we got all the young, but we didn't get her. So interesting. Put new eight new bands on. Uh, two of them were two more recaptures. So we had ten. We, I put a hundred numbered pin tags on the <coughs> ducklings, so they're all marked. And I fitted six hens with uh, geolocators. I'm going to talk about that when I talk about the research. People always ask, how do you catch a merganser? And you know what? This year we had a GoPro, and we just took the GoPro along on our, on our trapping expeditions and we put together. So I'm gonna show you a little clip here of how we catch Mergander. <coughs> it's a net uh, that's that's like monofilament gill net for fishing. And uh, it's like Velcro. They get in there and they get caught and, and they, they're easy to get out. And so we put it in a V, we push the, the mom will try to stay with her young, most of the time she'll stay with her young, and we push them under a dock into this V net. Uh, here's a couple little clips. So here's the V, they're coming into the V. Now there's a picture where the GoPro's on the dock and they're actually gonna go, the V is on there, there they go. You can see them going, the mom comes in. And then they go towards the, I wish it was a little darker in here, but. So then we have these special nets, we grab them out of that I invented, made, uh, where they get caught and then we just take them, take the chicks, take the hen, <coughs> And we put them in special cages. So there's the hen. Drop them in the cage. Again, you can't see it that well, but and we trans relocate for how to catch them. Let's we'll talk about research. General research first. Does the di difficulty for for gangsters to find suitable nest sites limit their population size? One question that we are trying to answer. Why are there only X number of broods per in the summertime on any given lake? We've seen this for 35 years. You would think maybe there's not enough food for them. Well, there's plenty of minnows. They can eat exclusively minnows, live minnows. Maybe it's a territory thing, but maybe it's the finding of the nest sites. And so uh, we, I, we, and I had a lot of help, but we spent time this spring. Uh, this is a selfie I don't know, I think it's the first selfie I ever took, but it was so cold. May, if you didn't remember, was the windiest May we've had in 20 years. And we know that because we were trying to be on the lake every morning. Uh, and it was really cold too. This was in late May, and I won the lake. Um, exploring is delightful to look forward to back in front of us. It's not comfortable at the time. Unless it be of such an easy nature, not deserving that. I had that in my cabin on Lime Lake, and every day I'd go home after spending the time on going to Blind Lake and being frustrated, and I'd have to just remind myself, you're exploring, this is new, you're cutting in ground here, you have to stay positive. Uh, I would call Rob sometimes very discouraged, and, and uh, we would help each other do well. No, we're, we're learning as we go here. So here's what we did. Nest search for grass. We're, we're, we're searching for the nest, okay? Because if we can find the nest, and if that is truly limiting, then what if we seal off those nest sites? Then we wouldn't have to trap, we wouldn't have to relocate, they would just wouldn't nest on that lake. That's the, the concept. We located what are called, what we call suspect areas, defined as a small area, a few acres, where beehiving behavior was observed. What's beehiving behavior? We know this day after day. Males and females would fly above the trees as if it was a disturbed uh, beehive where they just circle and circle and dive into the trees and circle. And they would do that for up to two to three hours. And they would disappear in the tree and then they'd come out. And then they'd circle and they'd disappear in the trees and they'd come out. And that area that we would say, well, there's gotta be a nest there because they're just, there's, there might be 15 at a time, 15 birds 
flying and just back and forth, back and forth about this area. So that's a suspect area. Then we say, well, there has to be a tree, so let's locate a tree. A, for us, a suspect tree is defined as a tree with a suitable cavity, in other words, there's a hole, where we actually saw Mergenzer's landing or actually going in the hole. That's a suspect tree of, of a nest. There were times, I think the record, I saw five female Mergenzers sitting, sitting in the same tree with a hole. Five. Had three, had another one with four. Incredible that these birds, and then they land on this tree and then they, they'd sit there. So, like, well, what, what's going on here? There's, that must be a nest. That's a suspect tree. And then a confirmed nest is one where we actually saw eggs, feathers, or observed the, the chicks leaving the nest. On one light, we had nine areas that are dark there where we saw this beehive activity, four on, on line. We had help using drones to help locate suspect trees. We have the area, let's find the tree. Well, we can see from the ground, but we can't see from the air. So we got Dennis and Rob to work with the zero gravity, and I want to play this here and show you this while I talk about them. But, you know, I can't say enough good things about these guys. This is a drone, by the way. They're in the lake, and the drone is above the trees, and we're going to try to look for uh, possible sites where, where we saw this beehiving activity. So the drone is going to start looking around. Uh, Dennis uh, is here, and Rob is here too. Yeah, these guys right here. Um, Dennis is a nationally known photographer, works with Long Lake, uh, right here near Traverse City. Um, and Rob is, I think, flew drones in Iraq and Afghanistan, and works with the college uh, training. It's one of the reasons that it's one of the best training uh, colleges in, in the country. So you see this is this, the drone, and they're flying this, these guys are flying this, and hey, what about that right there? Go in and take a look at this, and the drone can come in and do things that we couldn't do, uh, you know, from, we're out in a boat also, watching this activity. And so uh, they also do a lot of work, zero gravity with uh, your shoreline, uh, looking at invasive plants and, and such, I highly recommend that. So it's zooming in, saying, "Oh, there's a hole right there," and he can go right on down and say, "All right, let's take a look." So there it is. So it's pretty impressive. So we found on one like eleven suspect trees. Three, the one in the middle is just saying line light. That's not a tree out there. Uh, three on <laughs> line light that we found. So then, all right. So let, let's try to get confirmed nests. So let's use a trail cam. There's a trail camera sitting over here. You can't see it because of the light in here, but there's a hole right there. Can you see the bird? Yes. Okay, so there's a merganzer sitting there. Can you see the merganzer? Yes. Flying in, but can you also see that merganzer? There's another merganzer. This one's flying in, this one's going to go looking at the hole, this one's going in the hole. So you'd say, well, that's a nest. We have a GoPro pole, so we have this long expandable pole, put the GoPro at the top. And we're going to check out these nests to see if they are actual active nests. So this is the GoPro on the end of the pole going up. back the next day, she goes in again for 9 minutes and 50 seconds, say well, that's got to be a, that's a, that's a female going in the same hole over and over and over. Here's what we found. On line lake, four suspect areas, three suspect trees, one lake 9 and 11, confirmed nests, zero. <laughs> we have high standards, <laughs> but quite frustrating. Did we learn a lot? Yes, we did. I certainly would put money that we have some nests, but I wouldn't be able to put my life on it. Confirmed nests. Well, 
at that point, I had the idea, I read an article, and uh, they were using geolocators. What's a geolocator? This little device hooks onto a band. That one I put on a female. And that little device records a light intensity stamp, a date and a time every five minutes, for two to five years. And it's good down to 500 meters, waterproof. So if we can put these on some hens, let them go, next year they come back. Remember, they come back to the same, same lake, same tree. They go in the tree, the light's gonna go out. They go in the hole, the light's gonna go out. For how long? Well, however long they stay in there. So we can maybe find out when they start to incubate, how often they check, you know, what trees they go, how often they check, uh, you know, go in the tree, how long they stay. A lot of natural history, possibly, uh, from these little geolocators. We put three on hens on Glen Lake, two on North Lake Glenelg, one on Lime Lake. And that one we put on Lime Lake was the third year. We had captured that hen the third year. And now she has a little extra present on her leg that we hope to recover. Wow. QPCR driven research. QPCR, I'll explain real briefly what that is, but this has been like a gift for me because it has allowed me to answer some questions that I've had on my brain for a lot of years, working on swim research, and we could never answer. But because of some new technology, we are able to answer some questions, and I'll show you that here in a second. It stands for quantitative polymerase chain reaction, doesn't mean a lot to you. We use it as a worm counter to quickly, precisely, and extensively assess the risk of swim residue by counting the number of worms, the circari, remember that, that life cycle I showed you, in a known volume of water. How does it work? Very simply, well, not really, but this is DNA, double-stranded, split it apart, grow both sides, now one becomes two. Do that twice, do it again, do it again each cycle. We would run this for 50 cycles. The speed at which it multiplies tells you how much you started with. So if you have a known volume of water, well, let's take a look. Standard collect collection protocol, we're collecting X number of liters of water, running it through a filter, uh, putting it into these uh, storage containers, bringing it back to the lab, extracting the DNA, running the qPCR, 50 cycles, each cycle is about a minute, so 50 minutes later, you're gonna get a readout, and I won't go into all the details here, but you get a readout, and those, how fast it grows tells you how much DNA you started with which tells you how many worms you start. We did a single blind test to test for accuracy, and we had uh, three different tests, and each one the, the, we could get to 0.4 worms. So we could tell plus or minus 0.4 worms how many worms were in the water with a known blind hole. Uh, for every sample, this is, this is playing out as we speak. For every sample, it, we, sent the sample to Edmonton. Sydney ran each one in duplicate on a core machine. We had a, a, a mobile machine at Lime Lake. So every sample we took this summer was run three times. We took the raw filter. When we filtered that water, we cut it in half. We preserved half of it at negative 80. So it's good for years and years and years. And so you could go back and you could sample, start from scratch. You say, well, here's the filter paper at this date, at this time, at this location, and you could uh, go back and, and redo the study. And we also did that with the DNA that's extracted. We only take about 10% of the DNA extracted. By the way, that's DNA of all things living in the water, not just the, the worms, it's anything. So if you wanted to go back 15 years from now, say, I wonder if we had that algae, you know, what, how much of that algae was in our water? We have preserved samples. This technology is moving very rapidly. Core machine runs over 380 samples each time, each hour. We had a mobile machine at Lime Lake, 16 samples each hour. The company we're working with as developers, Biome, they have a unit, three samples each run, but the, the nine sample ones coming out this winter, that is an iPhone in there. Take your phone, you put it in there, and you run this right there. So you could, we're running QPCR 
for the handheld device. So the mobility of this testing for, um, for worms in the water is, is, is moving rapidly, which is good news. All right, let's look, take a look at some of the research. We did weekly water sampling. That was our metric. So every, all of the lakes we, in the Leelama project, we went every week for nine weeks and collected water samples at eight locations or nine or, or four online because it's smaller. Came back and here are the results. These are median number of circaria per 25 liters. So 25 liters for you uh, metrically challenged people is like uh, uh, six and a half gallons. So picture a five gallon bucket, a big five gallon, a bigger five gallon bucket, right? That, that's about how much water we're dealing with. Glen Lake, they're the winners from our study. You'd expect that. Why would you expect that? They had 64 hatched year mergansers on their lake all summer last year. So you'd expect that. North Lake Leona, wow, quite a bit less. Now these are for the whole summer for all the spots. Quite a bit less, you'd expect that. For that lake, which is the same size, shoreline miles as Glen Lake, big and little Glen, they only had 11 birds on their lake last summer. They had a brood of four and a brood of, one, or a brood of seven. So that whole lake had, had only 11 birds on it all summer, reseeding the snail. Lime Lake, I'm going to skip this one. Lime Lake, you'd expect that. We've been trapping, they've had zero mergansers for the last couple of years. So any larvae we're seeing would, would most likely come from migratory birds, spring and fall. So that's a little bit of swimmer's edge. What we didn't expect, South Lake Leona. No mergansers last year, no mergansers this year. Uh, we did a survey last year, yet they had higher swimmer's itch parasites than North Lake Leona. Interesting, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. I'm going to go quickly here. We did a research project on South Lake Leona. Try to answer some of those questions. <coughs> this copper sulfate used as a molluscicide, again, there's still some people, Michigan still permits it to apply copper to the area to kill the snails for uh, controlling swimmers itch. Does that really reduce your risk <coughs> of getting that? Um, well, we never could really test that until now. On the southwest side of South Lake Leelanau, this is the area, 2,000 feet of frontage. We had three sample sites inside. We had one on the south side and one on the north side. We sampled these places for five days prior to when they applied the copper sulfate. Then we went back and we uh, checked every week for the rest of the summer after they applied the copper sulfate to see is your risk of getting swimmer's itch reduced. Because what causes swimmer's itch? The larvae. We're counting the larvae in the water, in a five gallon bucket of water, right? We also did pre and post snail diversity, number, species. We threw these hoops uh, out. We did 400 of those hoops to quantify how many snails they had because we wanted to know how, how many snails did they kill. By, uh, by doing this, and this is the GoPro again, checking out. And then we actually collected them with little scoopers. We collect the snails with wetsuits. This is a little busy, but I'm going to give you a general here for lack of, of, of more time. I'm just going to give you the, the overall. The blue is inside the treatment area. That's where they apply copper sulfate. The red was on the north side, outside, and the green was on the south side, outside. But, and this is right here is when they applied copper sulfate. So they killed the snails. The blue is how much swimmer's itch they had before and how much they had after. So you might look at that and say, well, did it really do anything as far as reducing this, the, the risk of getting swimmer's itch? And I would argue probably initially at least uh, no. Not at this point. Um, does time of day impact the risk of contracting swimmers? In other words, we all know how to swim now. So here's what we did. Took one lake on one day. Eight locations. You can't see them very well. There's three on Little Glen, five on Big Glen, all the way around. 
and we took samples every four hours. So we went there at eight, each of, each of those spots, at noon, at four, and at eight. We collected known volume of water, same amount, ran the samples. Water temperature, wind speed, and direction was recorded. This won't make a lot of sense, maybe, but this is how we put the data on the, the, the wind direction was the arrow, kilometers per hour, wind direction, so very light, how many larvae, and this is actually uh, larvae per liter, having converted it, we have time. But anyway, the, 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 the noon, the four o'clock in the afternoon, and the eight o'clock at night. Before you get all one up and take you too long to look at that, let's just look at the overall. It's the proportion of, of larvae or cercaria worms collected. Notice the red, quite high, blue, the green, four in the afternoon, and the yellow, the eight at night. Look at it a different way. Larvae in the water. Larvae in the water, then it goes down quite a bit. So maybe the take home is, oh, I need to go work on my boat lift. When do you usually do that? You get it done in the morning, right? So you can relax in the afternoon. So this would suggest maybe um, it might be safer to swim later. Um, again, some interesting research. Are the security, the worms, distributed evenly throughout a water column? I wanted to know, I want to take a column of water, and I want to slice it and take columns. So I invented this uh, device with valves that I could just put in and close the valves, bring it over and undo and take each, each slice of water in that column. So we did that 30 times, 30, each one is about 550 milliliters, a half a liter. So we did it 30 times and then we repeated that three times. We found that by far, most of the, and we expected this, the larvae in the top, top of the section. We didn't find any in the middle. We found some on the bottom. You know, people have said before, when I go out, we stir up the bottom, I usually get some more. And I always say, nah, that's not how it works. But we did find some on the bottom, which is interesting. Don't know what to make of that, but maybe they do are hung up down there. And Maybe there's some, I don't know, we would need some more work for that. What time of day was that that you took those water? Um, That was a good question. I would have to look at my notes, but somewhere around late morning. Okay. We wanted to have enough security. Yeah, yeah, good question. How long is security viable? About a day. Every morning they're, they're kicking out new ones, the snails, spores. Is that explaining the more early morning? Uh, How do you define top? Is that two inches or? No, four? that's a good question too. What we did, because it, it varies, right? The bottom, you put it on the bottom, <coughs> you know, all the way up. But then the top could have been the top one, whatever was left, and so it could have been this much or it could have been this much. And so the top volume was not the same volume as these other ones. These other ones were a given volume. So then we adjusted the numbers based on that. But so it, it, we tried to get it as much as we could. We, you know, it wasn't like a floor like this where you could get it exact, but we tried to get it to where the top was essentially the same, you know, six, six, eight inches is what we attempted to get, but it wasn't exact. Yes. yes. Ron, what was your sample size on that? Does it cure? Well, like I said, we did, we did 30 at a time, and then we repeated it three times. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I answered question myself but the because you're using the multiplication factor to determine the quantity I'm assuming then that that the, it's only live level okay. Okay. well that's a good question because I'm because just I'm wondering about the bottom right the ones on the bottom of that DNA the theory that. That we talked about was maybe there were some dead ones that did get stirred up they had died gone pop because they are more dense and then when you plunk that down it stirred up enough where they came in and, and we got it. so there's certainly Certainly, some truth to that. Yeah, as long as I can go longer, I'll take questions. But I, I have some good stuff here. I'll get your. We'll be around. I'll have. We'll do that lunch maybe. Okay. Can circuitry be blocked to prevent contracting swims? 
What about a swim bath? <laughs> Most are carried rise to the surface and move follow the wind and wave. Can safe swim areas of any size be created to protect against the floating security? Well, we created on North Lake Lillon and on Glen Lake, we created a swim baffle. It's not really a swim baffle. Uh, this is made for controlling oil spills in the ocean. <laughs> I got it off the uh, off the shelf, so to speak. Uh, so it's it's really heavy duty. It wasn't made for this, but it was something that we could try as a prototype. And what we did, this is how Glen Lake that was on North Lake Lillanol. And what we did, the first try, is we wanted to know what if we were to go in here and remove all of the stag nickel, one species of snail, let's remove all the stag nickel. Well, how could you do that? Well, we had uh, zones and you swam in the zone every five minutes. Kelsey would blow a whistle, we'd come over and we'd dump our snails and she'd count them. So we knew how many snails we were getting. And we did that until we essentially couldn't find any more snails. So we assumed that we got all the snails. And to do this 50 foot by 50 foot area, uh, in less than an hour, we had 100% of the well, wall. You never get 100, but essentially 100% of the snails. Gone. In a bucket. Less than an hour. Well, in Glen Lake, for example, 827. Well, inside, so here's what we did back up, back up. So we cleared the snails, then we went home. We came back the next day. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and we took water samples in the baffle area, and we took water samples outside the baffle area. So we didn't do it that day, because that was the day we cleared the snail. But the next day. These are inside the baffle. These are values outside the baffle. And some of these are incredibly high. Like, remember, you're talking about a big five-gallon bucket, right? 400 in a five so what we're thinking is, yeah, that the larvae actually did bunch up on the outside uh, with very few on the inside. Well, knowing that, we thought, well, can circari inside baffles be effectively, and I was trying to come up with a word that is, <laughs> I hate these things, and emasculate. Like, can we destroy these things and maybe make it safe without even, uh, without even removing the snails? Just let the snails give up there in the morning, because we know in the morning, we're, we're learning it. In the morning, okay, let's let them get, and then let's go out there and let's emasculate them. I looked at the definition, it means to like, get rid of them, right? So I invented what we call the smasher. So I say there too, don't worry about this, is a different, it has a diving unit, but I took the unit off, I put a pump, just a, a water pump, this is a skimmer, pool skimmer. So it takes the top couple inches of water. When you're cleaning the bottom of your pool, this sucks up the leaves and stuff off the top. This little valve is so that I can get the right amount of water coming through here. So intake, intake, output, and you can't see it very well, but there's a screen on there. So we're just blowing water out and, and with the centripetal force and then smash them against this screen. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can break them apart. They're fragile. They only live for a day, they're fragile. They break right here. The tails break off. So maybe we can force them to do that. So what we did is we put the lines to it and we just pulled it back and forth. We sort of vacuumed the top. And we did it for a half hour, 30 minutes. We thought, we did the math and with two inches of water, it'd take you 11 minutes to get all the water. We thought, oh, being Dutch, let's just, you know, a little's good, lots better. Let's do it for a half hour. We did it for 30 minutes. And we, and, and then, so we, back up, we took water samples first, then we did this for a half hour, then we put it away, and we went back and took water samples again. And we did that twice, we only did this twice, and we replicated it twice. Before, how many larvae were in the water before the smasher, and how many after? So we felt that we could actually emasculate some of them and see if we could create an area that maybe we could, uh, in front of your place, immediately, not taking a year's last of but immediately get some relief from some sort of this. So that was the thing. Now, 
I'm getting near the end here. I'm going to be great. What parasite system is working in South Florida? It's a great question. We did 118 weekly water samples. 85 of them showed positive for something. Wow. We checked 45 hatch year mallard, because you want to do the hatch year, because if they're after hatch year, if they're the adult birds, they could have flown in with them. If we want to get the hatch year, they were raised there. Seven were positive. Two of them actually had medium intensity enough where we could collect them here in City and send them away and have the DNA code to see what species We did a survey, so that's 363 mallards we saw that day on the lake, and then we got set, uh, 45 samples survey day. It actually went a couple days to get that one. It's not that easy, right? You have to get them. This one, my daughter, she had her toes painted color and the little ducklings were pecking at her toes thinking it was something yeah, it's crazy. But we're waiting for them to poop, right? So here we're feeding the bread, open them, but now there's a poop and then you pick it up. And bring it back to the lab and analyze it. So this is Kelsey looking at it. It smells up the lab, but these are samples that we're analyzing. We did 12 hatch year Canada geese, one was spot. Uh, 23 geese observed on the whole lake during the survey. We got 12 samples, one of those. The verdict is still out. I'd like to give you an answer. It's just happening too fast here. We don't, we have to analyze, we have to come up with some hypotheses on what's going on in South Lake Leonor. We do know they have swimmers itch and they have uh, a sizable number of swimmers itch in our water samples, uh, what's going on. Um, there's things that may be pointing to other things besides the Mergans or that might be creating an issue here. Lastly, education. Uh, assisted Susan as best I could with the MSIP website. I would highly recommend it to you people. I think the vision and I don't know if it still is or not, but this was initially the vision is let's just have one website. Anybody doing work out there, let's have one website. Let's have everybody go there. Let's have everybody report their cases there. <coughs> if you have one at your lake, just direct them to this one. Because then John could go to that and you know, could get money and say, look at all, we have it all together in one place. And education and, and research that's being done, uh, that's the goal. I have not. Uh, made my website live because I'm hoping that this takes off and, and we can all go here. That would be ideal. Um, summer presentations, I thank you. I was invited to present uh, our findings and what we were doing at different places and I appreciate that. Education is a big, big piece. We trained uh, Joe Blondie at Bruce Hood. They're not here today. They're teaching. Uh, excellent. Gentlemen, they're actually going to do the trapping. Rob's going to talk more about this afternoon, I think. Uh, but they're actually training how to trap, ban, relocate for answers. And so we're trying to make this so we can spread out to other places. Patrick was here for 10 days presenting to a group. And of course, we had time to socialize on life. Publication. Uh, we are absolutely trying to publish. We have one manuscript already submitted. Out for review. We have three other manuscripts in various stages of uh, development. And don't forget, Ron, that you have the Legal Mount Project Final Report to do yet. <laughs> and I haven't started on that. <laughs> Today is happening, but that's the last thing, and then that will be made available for people to look at too. So, ways to educate. I thank you, thank these people, organizations, and you for all the volunteer work that you guys do to make all this happen.